Hello, beloved poets. Welcome to Open Minds, Open Mic, the place to be on a Friday night. And tonight, we have quite a delight for you in store, and it's going to be an amazing show. Of course, we'll have our open mic shenanigans, but we're going to have a special treat, a special entree, if you will, in the form of Zachary Kluckman with a delectable, at least a half hour feature. And again, this is the standard here at Open Minds. We ensure that when a feature is given a spotlight, it is their time to shine, their time to be able to share. And, um, and speaking of sharing, have those um, socials handy, those links handy, promote any and all things you got going on, not just for the feature, but for everybody here. So we can all gather and support each other in doing what we're doing, getting involved in each other's communities, because that's how we all grow. Um, we grow within each other and within ourselves. And I want to be able to promote a strong sense of that. Um, with that said, and speaking of um, promoting, um, I posted in the group chats um, a little support uh, image there. Um, in case you know, you're you enjoying what you're experiencing here and you want to be able to give back to Open Minds, there's Cash App and PayPal information to support Open Minds. Uh, keep uh, the Zoom room uh, afloat. With that said, um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Marianne Teft. Welcome. A pleasure to see you again. Um, just to confirm real quick, would you like to be on the open mic list? All right, delightful. Let me add you to that. And speaking of the open mic list, uh, I'm just going to be updating that every so often, posting in a group chat every so often. So with that said, let's get the shindig started. On deck, we got Beowulf, but stepping up to the plate, leading off tonight, please give it up for John Michael. Please unmute and take it away when you are ready. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, I have a little piece called Enchanted that I wrote last night. The forest burns and these fire lines spread throughout my land like lightning in the sky. This fire hot, turning everything to molten ember, glowing this thought in the dark of night, flaming each limb of ash, resurrecting a seed of new growth. Gold turned to green, these luscious fields, the breeze brings with it peace. Beneath the stars I breathe, forever enchanted. I got one more piece. Uh, this one I never titled. To look at you and get lost in deepness of eyes so blue. For in you I see the deepest oceans. And I want to drown in all of you. A home built for two from the internal soul we soul in motion. We magnetically connect. And all the dots come together like the stars at night. There is no fight or fright, only light and a calm through a storm that raged in both our nights. Passion ignited by the spark I find in thee, yet I feel free, I can breathe. For once, I can see what it is to love unconditionally. See, you plus me equals family. A unity with a bond stronger than any community. Made from the same star and both born to shine, inspiring each other to climb the ladder to our higher self. Disdain to the whispers of our fear and doubt, reminding each other's truest self it's okay to just breathe. Drop others and leave when it doesn't suit your higher purpose. For their abuses met their surplus and we don't need to buy in. Live in sin for the mistakes of our younger self. We can choose today to forgive that version, change the person, and remember the light we hold within our own soul. Guiding each other through darkness, we find solace, know what it's like to be home. 
You are never alone or will be in any life, for I will search day and night to reunite our souls. We'll meet again. And we are eternity. Like I said, you plus me equals family. John Michael, thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for being able to come in. Uh, everybody, please unmute. Give it up for John Michael at this time. Yeah. Woohoo! Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Nice, cozy, wholesome way to kick things off. I appreciate you, John Michael. Uh, keep working that pen to your fullest. With that said, we're going to keep the shin dig rolling. On deck, we got Angel Kim. But step into the plate now. Please give it up for Bear Wolf. Unmute and take it away when you are ready. Good evening, all. Good evening. Uh, it's always good to see y'all. Sorry I don't get here that often. Um, but the semester is coming to an end. So uh, I have some time, and I had to make time for Mr. Zachary Kluckman. Y'all, if for real, if... If not next year, the year after, one of these years, you need to get to the Poetry Festival out there because it is amazing. And uh, Albuquerque is beautiful. And just check it out, y'all. Just check it out. I got a, a couple short poems for you. Um, there's a lot uh, going on in the world, you know. I don't know if y'all have noticed or not. So I got a couple poems for all that. Here you go. Uh, first one is Dr. Seuss, Tom Waits, and Frank Zappa walk into a bar. The otters are attacking. Humanity is lacking. Mother Nature's had enough of our shit. The orcas are sinking, all the conquerors thinking, but they still haven't changed one bit. The fires are raging and the future is staging, our ice melting away at the core. Our mother is quaking at this culture of raping. Still, they keep digging for more. Take all that they can before this shit hits the fan that abandoned it all left for dead. The metaphors are packed in these otter attacks, but reality, well, that's just in our heads. It's not really two, or it's red versus blue, or it's who has the most likes and snaps. Instead of watching the wild, we just ride the denial as we fall for these self-hunting traps. You see, there once swam a shark in Nantucket who observed too much scum and said, fuck it. Time to ease the earth's woes. I'ma eat all these hoes because they're really just chum in a bucket. Uh, this is called Ripples and it's dedicated to all my sinner poets and proud weirdos. Let those who live within sin cast the first stone because we are not alone. This stone is skipping across the universe sending ripples like gravitational waves that pave the ways for creative forces to flow. Far stronger than just rolling the bones, these stone thrown ripples always beat the house solid, never to be taken for granted. These granite salutations create the foundations that can bring down this Goliath nation of ego fuck towers built on funeral wreath flowers, reminding us that we have the power if we just choose to stand up and live it. So don't tell us not to throw our stones just because you need to atone for all of your sins against our humanity. You see, that is the true profanity, trying to pull it all apart instead of bringing us all together. So let us flock like birds so we can spread the word. We must not let them call our herd with false prophecy and forced autocracy. They will not block our way. We will have our say. It's time for us to have ourselves a real judgment day. So yes, go ahead and throw those stones. Let our ripples grow. Tsunami tidal waves that usher in new days of community, culture, poetry, and song. This is what they have feared all along. And then I just have one last one for you. It's a micro poem. Uh, it goes something like this. I pledge allegiance to the people of the lost grace of America and to our humanity, which will not stand for this annihilation, just disappointing God until there is liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for encouraging my behavior. Thank you for having this, and I look forward to listening to the rest of you. Oh, what a pleasure to have you here again. Everybody, please unmute. Show your love for Bear Wolf at this time. Woohoo! Uh, yeah. yeah. Bye, Bear. Oh. That was great. Hell yeah, brother. Hell yeah, brother. Again, wish you know, 
all is well on your end. And we're going to keep this shindig rolling. Fuck yeah. All right. On deck, we got Principe. But stepping up to the plate, batting third, give it up for Angel Kim. Unmute. Take it away when you are ready. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> Y'all bear with me. My allergies are kicking my butt, as always. I swear, I just need a bubble. Um, This is my birthday poem. So thank you for the birthday wishes again. And I'm going to give you this. It's called Proof of Life. I used to call this day a betrayal. Reminders of breaths I cursed for taking. Hours carving their names into my chest. See, I now see my pulse as a no apology. It's sound of unfinished verses, songs with God refused to end. I fought in rooms where my silence was loudest scream unheard where ceilings pressed like verdicts and my hands turned jury where I tried to write myself out of existence but ink spilled faith I didn't know I carried etching prayers in the morrow of my survival these scars aren't trophies see they hold truths only a battlefield can teach I've learned survival isn't always grateful Sometimes it's clawing through rubble with nothing but a splinter of hope and a stubborn refusal to disappear. I used to hate candles, how they mocked me with their fragile flicker, lighting up memories I refused and tried to bury. Now, seeing their flames as proof I've burned but never burned out. There were days I called for an end, marked it in my mind with a period so final, I thought it was still everything, and I was wrong. God turned that period into a semicolon, pausing me just long enough to remind me my story wasn't over, remind me he wasn't finished with me yet. Now each birthday's a mark, milestone, milestone of a road I once refused to walk where numbers don't mock me anymore they honor me tell me I'm a survivor mosaic of broken and mended pieces melded together to make something beautiful from something no mirror could ever could capture today I stand where endings once lived breathing and life almost surrendered, seeing my scars are signatures. God's proof I was built to withstand. Each birthday is a resurrection, a celebration of battles I've won, and promise of chapters still unwritten. I used to hate this day. Now, I light candles seeing their glow as a quiet defiance against darkness that tried to claim me. This milestone isn't just a day, it's a monument, proof I'm here, and proof I was always meant to be here all along. What a, what a beautiful piece that was. Damn right. Everybody, please give it up for Angel Kim at this time. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful pieces. Mm -hmm. Wow. And we're off to a hell of a start here. Wow. Beautiful, powerful pieces all around. Kudos, everybody. And I'm looking forward to see what happens um, with the rest of the night. With that said, we got on deck uh, Nemo Soon. But stepping up to the plate now, please give it up for Principe. Unmute. Take it away when you are ready. Uh, you, I think you need to unmute.
the poem, the first poem is called The Nectar and the Flower. It once was a bee that flooded with grace. It quickly raced to find the sweetened nectar. Sweetened nectar then, sweetened nectar from the flower. The flower, green, spiny stem, stood upright in the ground. Meanwhile, the sun made its rounds. The flower absorbing its nourishment. The bee came around the flower, the flower, gently sipping the nectar from the flower. Every sip levitated nectar. The bee lifted off and departed. Isn't it funny how wisdom like nectar is? The nourishment. So that makes us bees. The nectar supplies us nods for a lifetime. Nature in and of itself demonstrates how some desire wisdom. You know, I read one more. On the twist and turn. Uh, your heart is precious metal. Anyone can convert your mo your emotions. They most your happiness into particles of sadness, sadness through petals of tears and sentimental sorrows. Because you invest it into stocks of your, your over your relationships. That same investment had depreciated the value of love for you. Never again trust your heart in faulty hands. Of you. Your depreciated love is skewed and your, your your depreciated love is skewed and unscrewed. Just like rusted boats, self-love is gonna be your R O I restoring love on your once hardened heart. Never open your heart to does anyone because not everyone is fair. Thank you. Wonderful. Right on, everybody. Everybody, please give it up for Principe at this time. Hell yeah, my man. Principe. Oh, wow. Got people trickling in. Hell yeah. Just want to give a quick shout out to Freedom, Terry Rose Jertson. Midnight. Um, welcome to Open Minds Open Mic. Great to have you here. Uh, again, just to remind everybody, we have a policy here, Open Minds Open List. The list never closes, so if you'd like to participate, let me know, either in group chat or what have you. Uh, with that said, we're going to keep the shindig rolling. Um, on deck, we have the feature in form of uh, Zachary Cluckman, but stepping up to the plate now, please give it up for Nemo soon. I'll mute, take it away when you are ready. Thank you. Um, I have a sequence of micro poems. When my father decided it was time to go, he went. There was no hug that would hold him, but I did make him cry. On the day he walked away, he turned back with tears in his eyes. I think in that moment, leaving me hurt, knowing this was the forever kind of goodbye stung him a little bit. A few tears on a causeway shed for a son who was never good enough for him to stay. All the grass was dead and the air was only slightly cold under a silent gray sky. I walked and I smoked. The heart in my chest was freshly broken, still all jagged edges and I wanted to rip it out to stop it from hurting. As the sky darkened 
twinkle lights fought back with their little pools of defiant color. He has so much potential, they said. If only he would apply himself. But I didn't. Books stayed closed. And I played imaginary games with imaginary friends whose mothers waved from imaginary porches. I wish I could have defied my parents all along, but there was so much shame and too much doubt. So many times my face burned at their disappointment, my head bowed by their guilt. I learned to fight myself, learned to hate the dreamer who looked out the window instead of working. Foreshadowing the day, I would stare into the distance an unmarked test in front of me, penned down, heartbroken, the day after my father left for good. My anonymity became my refuge. Odysseus said it to save his life. When he got home, he killed everyone. I say it to save my dignity. There is no one who calls me son. Someday, somebody, maybe. For now, I am no one. For 20 years, I sat at the stoplight near my home, watching the leaves change and the trees turn into forests of pharmacies, always turning left, blinker clicking on and off and watching clouds while waiting. Now I go straight through the light, in silence, driving home and away from where my heart is. My decorations are staying in the closet this year, packed up pieces of a previous life. My childhood decorations are in a box in my mother's garage somewhere. They haven't been unpacked in 30 years. My children's tree has 20 years worth of celebrations hanging on its branches. But there aren't pictures of me in the house anymore. And I have to drive home after they've been nestled all snug in their beds. I got blown free by the explosion of another family. Or maybe I was cast out far enough that the place I lived is only a speck in the distance. Or maybe that's a tree. I never wanted to be cold again, walking these empty streets. I never thought I'd be standing on the wrong side of the glass once more, looking in to what it must be like to be together. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Please, unmute. Show your love for Nemo Soom at mm -hmm. this time. Nemo, mm. yes. Thank dig you. Dig it. Awesome. Dig it, dig it, dig it. Thank you so much, Nemo. As always, pleasure to have you here. Um, let's just do a quick little bit of housekeeping. I do see that Nadia would like to participate. Cool add you to the list and i see that amadeus has joined us welcome amadeus welcome to open minds open mic and i gotta say your timing couldn't be quite any better because uh we are just about to dip into our feature so with that said it's feature time all righty so it is um it is it's an exciting time of year and to be able to uh, provide um, some pretty gnarly um, features on this platform. And I'm excited to be bringing back um, Zachary Kluckman after having him on um, on the Slam Jam a couple months back. Just um, that's quite an impact. That's like, I want more. And I feel like the community, community can, can use a little bit more of, um, of some wholesome energy. So with that said, I'm going to give you all a quick little bio for the ones who aren't too familiar. Zachary Kluckman is a nationally ranked slam poet, acclaimed spoken word artist, and two-time Pushcart Prize nominee. With work appearing in prints worldwide, including Crab Creek Review, Arts and Letters, 
Kagibi, uh, The Pedestal, and Blue Mountain Review. Cluckman is the 2012 winner of the Red Mountain Press National Poetry Prize and a gold medal from the Scholastic Arts and Writing Awards. His newest collection, Rearview Funhouse, was published by Eyewear Publishing in 2023. And that's just a snippet, just a snippet of uh, things that he does, an organizer um, of many things. Um, just one of the most active uh, forces in the Southwest United States. Um, with that said, it is my honor, my privilege to bring forth to uh, Open Minds Open Mic to this digital platform at this time, Zachary Kluckman. Unmute and take it away when you are ready. Well, thank you. Um, I, can you hear me okay? I do want to just do a quick sound check. Everybody hear me all right? Okay, good. Um, thank you, first of all, for having me back. I really enjoyed being on the Slam Jam the other day, and and I just really uh, love the energy um, of that experience. So I'm looking forward to sharing tonight with you as well. Um, I'm going to add a couple of very quick notes to my bio. First, uh, first I'll say um, I, I do have this rather ridiculous extensive bio. But ultimately, what you need to know about me is I am a six foot marshmallow disguised as a Viking writing a lot of gay, uh, writing a lot of love poems to my gay children. So that's basically who I am. Um, I, uh, I write a lot about love because I think that, uh, but not in the traditional sense necessarily. I write those too, but I think that every poem is a love poem. I really do. I believe when you write about grief, you're writing about love. When you write about loss, or the human experience, or even politics, we're writing about love, whether it's love that's missing or love we're trying to find. Um, and I kind of carry that with me in a lot of my poems. So um, I want to say thank you too to Bear Wolf for mentioning the Chichara Poetry Snap Festival earlier. Um, it is, it's something we started this last year. Um, our next one's in March of 2025. And if you get a chance to make it up to New Mexico, we'd love to see you because it is uh, 75 of the top spoken word artists and slam poets in the country coming together. Um, we do workshops, we do readings uh, that are designed to elevate marginalized voices. We do, uh, we've got national book award finalists and slam poets and Grammy winners. And, uh, but most importantly, what we have is just community. A lot of people who love poetry and like to get together and, and hold each other up. So, um, so thank you for the shout out and uh, sorry, we won't see you there, there this year, but hopefully next year. Um, Oh, and if you do make it down to Albuquerque for that, uh, the whole event is free. So you can come for all three days for free. Um, so because um, poetry is too expensive and that's weird to me. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I don't write poetry that's political very often. Um, unless, of course, you're like my friend Hakeem and you uh, make the argument that uh, the personal is political. And that's another viewpoint that I think is really valid as well. Um, but I will... Uh, say that this one, um, nice, awesome. Um, I will say this one is one of my most political pieces in the sense that I feel like we live in a time now when it's really important for allies to, to be present and to be standing with the people that they're allies with, but not taking up those spaces, right? I think sometimes allies unintentionally take up space and speak for people. And, and I really think that as allies, our best you know, one of our best roles is to listen, but also to communicate with one another and other allies and say, hey, you know, let's talk about how we do this uh, appropriately, right? Um, so I wrote this poem in the effort to sort of speak to that. Um, <clears throat> Said the wolf to his God, when you look at me now, with the blood of the moon still in my jowls, do you remember as a cub how I chased the sun through the rain? How I whined with desire to own the light with my teeth? I'm not sure if you're listening, but I need to explain how rain finally made sense of the light. The way it bends through a prism of water re reminds us that its unity, its nature is a unity of color. They tell us this blending of hues creates a pure white radiant. What light creates is not white only visible. Isn't this what every man wants, what every woman wants to just be seen? Like any cub without a father, my heart listens hard for yours when the wind is in the trees. When the wind is your voice, heavy with things it will not say. 
the way light wraps around some bodies until they disappear, an absence only noticed by rain, by chalk and blood and tape. If death is a blind child looking for a hand to hold in the dark, why does it stand so often behind police lines, so often near bodies with dark skin? Why does it do this dressed in the robes of white wolves? I have grown to look like them, born with this coat, with the anger of a thousand wet birds. I no longer chase my tail or bark at the sun, but I have howled as my dark-haired cousins are hunted for their skin. I am afraid that death will come for all of us. Doesn't that make us allies in this fight? Said God to the wolf, hush cub, you are not the one being hunted. That is your privilege wagging its tongue. Your words are an eraser in the hands of an artist who is uncomfortable with the work he must do. When I made you, I named you with the sharp end of a bone, colored your fur with a handful of snow and spoke two commands down your throat, love and speak. You cannot do one of these without doing the other. Now bark, tell the wolves who run in your pack how the light dies if one color goes missing from the prison. Ask them how they will cure their blindness when they have chewed the eyes from their skulls. Tell them they cannot spit me on the ground in their froth and their frenzy while spilling the blood of my children. Do not blame me for your hunger. When has a father ever asked one son to kill another? I have watched you bite your gums for a taste of blood. Tell me, Cub, when the men come again with their guns and call the white wolves to their side, whose throat will your jaws find? said the wolf to his God, I will do as you have made me to do. I will stand with my dark haired cousins and offer my blood to the moon. Raise my voice to the wind and call all wolves to remember we are kin. When we see the gunmetal or badges come shining through those trees, we will stand together and we will show them our teeth. Thank you, that's that piece. Um, thank you. Um, I, uh, yeah, that one, that one took me a long time to write, <laughs> uh, really work to try to get, get it right. Um, you know, I, I like to call myself to task if I'm going to call anybody else to arms, then I, or not to arms, but call people to action. Then I want to call myself to action first because I need to make sure I'm doing the, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I need to make sure I'm doing the work too. So, um, I'm gonna change it just a little bit now. I wanna do, this is this piece is kind of one of my signature pieces. Uh, folks who know me probably know this poem well, um, but it is a poem that I wrote because I, I find it fascinating how afraid we are of affection in our culture in America, um, especially with our own children sometimes. There are some strange ideas about, um, it seems like we we have this messaging in our country that once a child is, six, seven, eight years old, we're meant to just, you know, not really show them the same kind of affection anymore because now they, you know, they should be okay, right? Um, and that's insane to me. I, that makes no sense to me. So um, I actually had people ask me this question and I decided as a poet, it was up to me to respond to it publicly. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so that's how this poem came to be. To the man who asks why I still hold my son's hand. I don't do it every day. I don't even get to see him every day. The moment you become a parent, you begin counting down to this, to the letting go. My ribs are an abacus measured in beats of his heart and the number of moments we have left that he'll want to be this close to me. But in the time we have, we are studying the philosophy of clocks. When first built, clocks were given hands as their instrument of time. I believe this is the clock builder's way of reminding us to hold on because time is a stampede of horses running straight at the cliff's edge, but the people we love are the parachutes we take with us. So when the road runs out beneath us, we do not fall. No, nah, we can't fall off that fucker. Listen, there's not much of it. So time is the greatest gift a man can give to his kids. My father gave me three gifts. A little red wagon he gave me for Christmas, a hand-stamped leather wallet he made for me in prison, and the hole in that wallet where whatever currency he hoped his memory would become fell out. No matter how poor I have been or become, I will never be my son's empty wallet. 
all I can give him are palm prints whispered into his hands and memories of crossing the streets he will know. I was there between him and the trucks, pretending to pull the sun out from behind the moon's ear and put it in his pocket. My son still believes my hands can do magic, but I'll leave the escape acts for runaway dads. Those Houdini cowards whose families have been left holding the chains on their absence. I am not gifted with wounds. Do not bleed sacred or know the secret name of the song that is sung when a child's first breath is taken inside of his mother. I cannot swim in that ocean, so this is as close to creation as I will ever come. But every time I hold my son's hand, I can feel God's heart beating. Why do I still hold his hand? Because he still wants me to. And listen, if we're telling the truth, Aren't you really only offended because you're worried that me holding his hand too long will cause him to seek affection from other men? To the homophobe who's overly concerned that me holding my son's hand past a certain age will cause him to grow up gay. Fuck you. If my son grows up to kiss sunlight from another man's lips, then by God, I will walk him down the altar aisle, and if he'll let me, I'll hold his hand all the way to the altar. Listen, I have a theory. There is one secret that love shares with the math of the universe. It's the subtraction in the equation that causes the problem to exist in the first place. This is true for a man and his kids as well. So as long as he is reaching out, I will take nothing away from my son, especially these hands. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to mix it up a little bit. Uh, I was very fortunate recently to win the Two Sylvia's Press Chapbook Award. Um, Oliver De La Paz, an incredible poet, uh, picked my my next manuscript as the winner, and uh, <laughs> nice. Um, and I um, am flabbergasted, honestly. So that will be coming out next year. But I thought I would share a little bit from that. The theme of that book is haunting. Um, and I mean haunting in all of the ways, because I, I often think that most of our haunting arises from within. We haunt ourselves, right, um, sometimes. And so that's uh, what I wanted to explore. Um, so in keeping with that, these next two poems actually come from that collection. And they're shorter, shorter pieces. Um, the first is a poem that I dedicate to anyone with mental health experiences. If you have ADHD, OCD, bipolar, any of those types of things, you may, you may understand this. Um, I will preface by saying, if you're not familiar with the zoetrope, so a zoetrope is those carousels that you see with the slits in them on the sides, and when they spin, they have images inside that look like they're moving. Um, they also used to call it a devil's wheel for some reason. So that's just helpful to know for the poem. Note to self that will become an apology later. First, you are a source of luminous wonder. Your brilliance fills the sky. Then... A seizure of darkness collapses your vertebral tower and boats sink in the harbor. A lighthouse pulls one hell of a shadow from inevitable blue depths. Haven't you been the night shredding radiance so many seek safe passage from? All the mythic creatures human hands have conjured from the depths come barreling toward the surface now. The ocean floor raises continents when it shudders. Your shaking is a seance summons ghosts from your throats. The light flash behind your eyes sends nightmares plunging into the ocean. Lighthouse Zoe trope. See how the islands dress themselves with the illusion of dance. How the wreckage pulls itself back together with a crack like leg bones snapping. One minute, you are alive with such incredible light. The next, phantoms peel themselves from the clouds. An island forest grows haunted with all the ships run ashore. Somewhere in that forest, a tree falls and crushes the only witness. Um, this one, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna lie, this one is actually one of my favorite poems. <laughs> um, it's called Possession. The neighbors report seeing a faceless figure sitting doll-like in my windows at night. Listen, I won't feign surprise. Sometimes I forget to wear my eyes. I put them on so carefully, this dry erase expression mimics birds in flight. My eyelashes grow in rows like shark teeth. Of course, I look startled. Waking each day surprises me, the way tigers arrive at a feast without their feet. 
Stealth and camouflage are defense mechanisms of the superior beast. When I hide in the grass, someone always complains. I once believed I had this chameleon DNA, but it was just youth trying again to make sense of fear. I do not belong to some genus or species named in a romantic tongue. I'm not that rare cryptid who emerges from the brush one sunny day, surprised by the commotion I have caused. Just a man, sopping wet with potential, as all good clay should be. They say we are made in another's image, and I wonder if they mean frightened. If they mean so unsure of creation, part of them is given nightly to wandering naked down these halls, looking indoors as if unfamiliar with this particular arrangement of rooms, rooms full of butterflies battering the walls in their cavernous home. A domed roof gives the illusion of freedom to the cage. My head works under a similar design. The random whorls of knot and wood often lead me to question whose fingerprints these are. In the feverish dark, don't we all hurl ourselves at shadows that, in whatever shapes we can touch? You are right not to question me when I speak of animals in my flesh. A man so familiar with watching the ghosts erase themselves from mirrors is not to be trusted. Hopeless romantic that he becomes, his mind is sure to turn its hauntings outward. Someone should inform the neighbors all of their houses are haunted. I have seen them there in the windows, holding court with cold shadows. Every room full of longing. Every memory a poltergeist. I um, I probably uh, I will mention I um I am actually a paranormal investigator too. So this uh, has, some of this is inspired. Um. Yeah, it's a great, it's a very interesting field of study. Um, so uh, I'm gonna shift ge gears again, um, and uh, well, thank you. Um, I uh, I do write about grief and loss fairly often. Um, I'm one of those folks who has had the dubious experience of living a life where that is a common, uh, unfortunately, occurrence. Um, and I think a lot of poetry is about trying to understand the missing what's missing um and when we speak about haunting that's often where that comes from i think is trying to make that peace with that with with, with what's gone um anyhow um this next poem uh i will give a trigger warning for because it does talk about self-harm uh so you know if you uh, need to step away for a moment for that to take care of yourself by all means please do At 14, my best friend Jerry was the pastor's son who carved the name of every girl he loved or wanted to love into the flesh of his arms with a razor blade. One look was enough to earn his blood. They called him crazy, but I don't trust the word sane, so let's just say committed. He never forgot their names, could tell you what color their eyes were. Still to this day, I wonder if wearing their names made him feel less lonely or more. I used to tease him and ask if they understood that this was what he meant when he told them he wanted to take them in his arms. The skin always spelled lonely. They called him crazy, but I wonder if they ever thought the word brave. Letting go is hard when you fear the expiration date of every smile. All he ever wanted was some small proof of each moment he came close to love. Each raised letter in his skin was a smile he had touched. Every pucker of flesh a kiss he could still feel with his hands while we got high outside the church where his father gave sermons. His body was an illuminated manuscript painted the color of romance, written in a violent braille. So desperate for touch, he touched himself with pain, with bleeding. I asked him once. He said that he felt every cut. I was always too afraid of the pain. Not the cursive or the bleeding, but the goodbye. I have spent my life writing letters only to myself on paper. These poems, these poems are the names of every person I never had the courage to lose. What he did to his skin was probably wrong, but what I have done to my own heart may be worse. He was Bradbury's illustrated man. One scar tissue tattoo short of his own story. I was more Frankenstein's monster, borne away by darkness and distance with the dark jealousy for the romance he had with his skin a witness to the strange intimacy of his pain. I wonder if Jerry has a family today. 
there was any room left. A patch of skin near the elbows or something around the wrist, perhaps to allow their names to spill across his skin. Or if he is still alone, has he crafted a complete alphabet of misconnections, drafted dictionaries of desperation down his legs, every word another person whose name was goodbye? Wherever he is, I wish that I could tell him that I will not start carving names in my arm or open a vein for love, but because of him, I did not wage war on my skin. I tore my heart open with a pin, found myself a child hiding inside, traced the blood to the wrist and wrote, because of you, Jerry, I know it doesn't have to hurt to open your arms. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I do got a few more if everybody's okay. Are we, are we still good? Okay. Um, I am going to get uh, sad again <laughs> for a moment. Um, I wrote this poem years and years and years ago, um, and it's a poem that uh, when I first did it, I couldn't do the poem without crying every single time. And one day I was in front of an audience doing the poem and I wasn't crying and I realized, oh crap, <laughs> uh, poetry is not just cathartic, it's actually healing. You can actually uh, heal and find find some sense of peace in the poetry and in the sharing of it. So, um, so I share this kind of in that spirit. Also, I'm going to sing, I apologize. <laughs> I knew how hard your skin could get until I held her hand last week and the callus ran away with the soft feminine I somehow came to expect she cuts her hands on a can she opens with a knife cuts her hair in the mirror and washes her clothes once a week by hand but they still smell like the road Dust blown and covered with moth wings from collection bins. Hand me down clothes like those that I grew up in. An inch too short at the wrist, but that inch makes her skin look like thin velvet puckered around the pulse. She tries to distract me with cigarette smiles, but won't tell jokes because she knows I can hear the fluid in her lungs when she laughs. Five minutes of childhood left me with very few memories, but still. I can hear her voice in small Texas towns where the reflection of fall leaves fell in through the blinds in my room and I went to sleep with one line of red light across my eyes. And she sang. She knew three songs. You are my sunshine, hush little baby, and Rod Stewart's You're in my heart, you're in my soul. You'll be my breath should I grow old. I remember these words like prophecy spoken in the midst of cicada mating songs at pecan picking green finger days. And I carried those words with me through gang fights with only me on my side. Carried them when we disowned the family tree to separate young limbs from unhealthy leaves. And I carried them when she swore that she loved me, but didn't really like me much because I missed the school bus one time. Product of small Texas towns and roughnecking women, she's homeless, but can't get a but she, and can't get a job welding anymore. So she's homeless, but too proud to come home. And I'll be double lot damned if I know what she's so proud of. But she insists on calling this freedom, and I just want to yell at her sometimes. Ma, come inside, please. It's cold. One day she'll start a publishing company, Percheron Press, which makes sense. A Percheron is a horse like the one in chess, and she's a horse in Chinese astrology, but she's never been much good at sticking with anything for long. That's one of those things she gave me to unlearn, but when I can find her and afford a ticket to wherever that is, we eat soup so thin it still tastes like the tap on the sink, and she refuses my invitation again. Her slow fade reminds me of this poem she wrote in 10th grade. It was called Tears in the Mist, and it was brilliant. Another prophecy of failing before she lost the key to this cage. Or no, you know what? Maybe it's me that's failing. Because I want to hammer myself into whatever absurd shapeless bird form it is that would set her free. But that joint in her hand just curls its thin smoke around her fingers. And she rocks herself in a cross-legged daydream of, pat of trance. Struggling with a past that just won't let her go. And I still want to yell at her sometimes. Mom. Mom, wake up. The language of birds is hers, so I sing. 
You're in my heart. You're in my soul. You'll be my. Maybe I wasn't really ready to be a parent to my own mother, but mom, I always loved your son. Thank you. Um, continuing along that uh, happy path, um, <laughs> I uh, I got one more about her. Uh, um, this one's a little bit different in tone, though, <laughs> so we'll see what you think of This is actually a pretty new one. Only a few people have heard this one, so uh, bear with me. We'll see how it goes. It's called Stained Glass Operating Room. Like most children, I thought crayons would taste the way they look, and I really, really wanted to know how purple tasted. Unfortunately, I learned the hard way that they taste more like candles than candy, but then I learned how to draw, or at least how to color the walls. And for a four-year-old in love with kaleidoscopes, the way the color shifted on those walls when I would spin as fast as I could was a kind of magic. My mother, the visual artist, could recreate Vallejo's dragons as if they rose from her wrists. Her hands understood light so well I believed they were a gift of the sun. She painted the way afternoon draws a shadow. It's funny how memory holds on to some things. She taught me to draw, then when I fell in love with poetry, she taught me how words become images, my first editor and my first fan. She taught me to avoid mixed metaphor, reminded me that poems don't have to rhyme all the time, even when rain on the roof sounds like a shower of dimes, and because of her, my mental thunderstorms sometimes become applause, a standing ovation for alliteration, but I keep coming back to that room. How I wished all that imagination on the walls made them into windows all that color making stained glass in my eyes. I didn't understand then what it meant when she rocked herself in the dark, spoke under her breath when alone. Sometimes I thought maybe my mama was a scarecrow haunting herself lonely no matter how hard I tried. I learned more from her than she meant to share. Like sometimes mamas keep their fists clenched so baby won't see how much they hurt all the time. Helpless to save her from the wounds of her mind, her whole body a moan she could not force from her lips. I watched trees rock back and forth during storms like her in the dark. It was like rain in the pecans. But memory is a useless endeavor, so maybe it is today she, they tell me she's dying. Ironic, a woman who struggles in silence, losing her mouth to cancer. Like her mind attacks her body for whatever grudge it holds against its own beauty. And I am that little boy again, looking for a crayon to color the walls, determined to draw her blue out into the open, strap it down in my stained glass operating room. I am her son. It is my job to save her. Her voice is the last note of the last song played on a broken piano when she speaks. It is the first time she admits she hurts all the time. But memory makes time meaningless, so maybe it is still today when they remove the roof of her mouth cut away the cancer, or maybe tomorrow they tell me she will live and she seems disappointed, or yesterday she dies years later on the floor of her trailer alone. Maybe memory is the kaleidoscope and all or none of this makes sense, or maybe it's all how you choose to look at it. All I know is, if grief was a crayon, then I have eaten the whole box, and there is no light coming through those walls. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to do two more, if that's okay. Are we still good? I don't want to over overshoot here. Um, okay, um, so we're going to end on a positive note, I promise. I promise. Um, <laughs> um, this one, though, is really important. This is another one that's new, and not many people have heard this, but I feel like it's uh, a poem I needed to write right now because a lot of folks are going through it for whatever reason, since the pandemic hit in 2020, it seems like the last four years have just been a long train of difficult moments for a lot of people, including myself at times. Um, so I wrote this for anyone who needs it, essentially. And this is called Love Letter If You Hurt. I'll tell you what I tell my ghosts when they come for a visit. 
Spear was here just a few minutes ago. Sorry, you missed him. Listen, I think you should know that I tell you I have known beauty. I mean that I have seen the view from Pike's Peak first thing in the morning. Watched a herd of deer nibble slow grass in the early morning fog near Fenton Lake. Red clay running in the rain. I mean that I have stood in the ocean and read poetry to a bird trying to swallow the sun. I have watched my own face on the body of my child open its eyes for the very first time. I mean that I have seen you smile even when it hurts. I know that sometimes it hurts. Sometimes the sky seems to exist only with the purpose of holding you down, to remind you of wings you were not born with. Some days so many things hurt, it feels like your skin is made of thorns and your bones all end and break. I'm born with a special knowledge of pain built only to carry the hurt and not just your own, because God damn it, you were born with a heart too big for one person alone. I know how you give it away, how people smile, call you strong, tell you how resilient you are, how proud they are of your strength, how they are never the same people who are not there with you in the dark, who have not seen you curled in your bathtub, hands, hands clenching at emptiness, reaching for a body exactly the shape of your loneliness, how you love phantoms and memories when no one is there to hold you. I know you're afraid there will never be anyone there to hold you, and if they are, you'll wonder why what they want, how their absence will haunt you when they eventually leave, even though you pray to a God you may not believe in that this time, this one fucking time, let it be real. Let them be real, please. Sometimes it feels like no one is real. Maybe you aren't even real, but listen, this is, I am, and you are real. It's fear that isn't real. Though it seems your constant companion, a ghost stalking the long abandoned halls of your heart, your head full of whispers when you are the one who has to hold everything together, when you are the one everyone expects to be the hero, expects to know the answer. Yes, maybe you had to raise the parent who was supposed to raise you. Maybe you had to care for your parents while they disappear in front of you, wash the hair of the dying, or explain to black holes why it is not okay to try and swallow your light and expect you to still be the only star in the sky. I know sometimes strength runs the fuck out and all the hope in your eyes feels like a life sentence. I know you feel guilt or shame when you can't help them, when you don't always know what to do. I know some days you are trying so hard just to keep your shit together that you feel alone, trapped in your body, that no one really understands how loud the silence is. Let me tell you again about beauty, about the smile you wore the day you discovered $10 in a forgotten pocket, the way you laugh when your cat jumps in your lap, when you write a poem so good you can't wait to share it before you convince yourself it's not good enough to share let me tell you how the sun framed your face the day you caught that big fish or the rain adapts itself to your body wherever you stand. Let me tell you something true and real. And please hear me when I say this. I love you. I have spent a lifetime haunting myself. Almost died five times, close enough to death to recognize the darkness behind his eyes. I have survived somehow. Times I should have died. Times I wanted to die but I have been sober now for 25 years. I have started to hold hands with my inner child and work towards forgiveness. So when I tell you that I know miracles, you'll just have to take my word for it. You are a miracle. You have nothing to prove. You are enough. Honestly, every time I see you, my heart breaks a little because that's what miracles do. They break you just a little, just enough to remind you you're alive. And I fucking love how alive you are. Thank you. Um, uh, one more, if you guys are okay with that. Um, I wanted to end with this because it is one of my uh, one of my favorite pieces, and it's pretty positive. Plus, I'm a huge introvert. I don't know if any of y'all are introverted, um, but um, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so this one is uh, a poem I wrote for the introverts, uh, including myself. Sometimes you need to hear yourself say stuff. Um, so this is a 12-step survival guide for introverts. One, 
Do not be ashamed of your silence. Speak only when necessary and your words will carry their own weight. This only makes your voice stronger. Two, do not let being alone make you feel lonely. Use the extra time to unwrap your middle name like the last box of dishes from your mother's kitchen. Learn to love the mirror for its gentle insistence that your skin carries light like a postal worker. You are here to deliver something. Three, treat the word love like a prayer. Speak it only when your soul has been shaken by a spirit so powerful you find yourself on the floor. Do not expect it to save you. Love, like prayer, is an act of faith that makes your body a holy place. So do not surrender your prayers to anyone whose hands are not clean enough to heal. Four, when you do choose to speak, do not whisper like rain. Gather as much of the sky as your lungs can contain. Scream like crickets, like cicadas. Covet the moon. Convince the sky of your claim by. The laughter of children is the sound the rain is trying to make. When it stands outside your door waiting to be let in, let it in. Keep the sky company. Six, remove the callus from your heart. All that hard flesh left on the meat from walking away a dozen, a hundred, a thousand times. Your chest is not filled with feet, so do not crawl on the floor looking for love. Stand up. Seven, when your son tells you that old people smell like books, <laughs> show him the goosebumps. Tell him that this is the power of his words. Teach him to understand conversation as the fine art of carving. Remind yourself of this lesson. Let silence be the tool of your creation. Eight, a room with six closed doors is not as inviting as a room with one that is open. You are not the only one who feels lonely, but your heart is a door, so open it. Keep the world company. Nine, love is not an animal to be chased by drunken moons. It is the water where the moon rests her head, the rest her head, the hot breath and wild eyes of something unseen. So when it comes, do not be startled by its movement in the trees. Ten, never give up on love. Keep coming back to this. Not the person who hurt you, but the idea. Remember that love, like God, is too big to hide forever. Eleven, you will fear that your last name your leftover bottles of your rainwater or your love of cicadas have taught the world to see you as strange, but 12, searching the carnival glass of their eyes, we find the strange beautiful. The long halls of their silence filling their throats with the sound they have learned to name prayer. The first to write poems are always the lonely. So when you feel lonely enough to write poems, search your eyes in the mirror for a sadness that reminds you of home and remember you are here to deliver something. The word you are looking for is hope. Speak up, poet. Thank you so much, y'all. I appreciate y'all letting me go uh, share so much poetry. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Everybody, please unmute and give it up for Zachary Kluckman at this time. Woo! Woo Amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Zachary. Woo wow. What an all-around wholesome set. I've been looking forward to this feature all week, legit. And I'm just excited that it happened and we were able to experience it all together here. And <sighs> what a range of emotions. Um, thank you so much, Zachary, for being able to craft these words. And to enlighten us and to remind us that you know that there is so much love out there and within us it's just a matter of being able to tap into that that last piece like removing the cows from the heart and that line about you don't have feet in there stand tall that was poignant and impactful and I appreciate you. Appreciate, I appreciate all of what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah. just a just a reminder: um, if you have um, any links to share, and that goes for everybody here, uh, if you have any links to share, whether it be social media, publications, events, etc., please utilize. Please utilize the group chat 
at this time and throughout the night so we can uh, check out what you're doing and uh, figure out a way to be able to support you because um, that's what we as community aim to do. So with that said, one more time, thank you, Zachary, for what was a wholesome, delightful feature. Great mm -hmm. to have you here again. And without further ado, we have a nice hefty open mic left here. So um, I reposted the um, the list short, uh, not too long ago, but just to give everybody a quick heads up, this is what we're gonna be looking at for the time being on deck. We got black noise, but stepping up to the plate now, please give it up for Marion Teft. Unmute and take it away when you are ready. Thank you so much, Dre. Thank you so much, poet friends. And Zachary, what a real pleasure uh, to follow you. I thoroughly enjoyed meeting you and your work at the Slam Jam. And what a beautiful resonant set it was tonight. I really needed it and appreciated it very much. It's 49 weeks tonight that I moved to Toronto after nearly 25 years in the Caribbean. And um, this is the first poem that I wrote in 2024, and I'd like to share it again tonight as the year draws to a close. It's called New Home. My new home is almost entirely of others' design, but naturally so when you leave one house with two decades of memories clinging to citrus walls and ochre tile, to enter another with all you can carry in three and a half bags and promise rising from rag-rugged wood floors. There are my baskets of shakers and shells, souvenirs of songs and strands from Amsterdam to Oz, displayed above a humming radiator instead of an airco. The palm frond rainbow fish that has held pride of place since my daughter toted it home from grade six art class now swims above a comfy sage green couch clad in fabric that leaves a swish when stroked with a hand, stumped down a winding staircase by three pairs of arms, plenty of clever geometry and only a little blue language because Cynthia and her husband thought I would like this three-seater so much more than the futon whose lineage was equal parts sofa and buckboard. Oh, and that espresso machine in the front hall is for me too. Not to forget the strong, slim space heater that has quickly become my new best friend. My sliders no longer survey a wide lagoon, strobe lights on the causeway or midnight sky that embraces three islands with arms thrown wide. But as I warm my palms with my Sunday cuppa, contemplative and well-rested, I glimpse the winter sleepy backyard through a ground level casement window, grateful to think these rooms have been fashioned in hospitality and love. A sliver of sun falls across the keyboard and I am at home. As I am here tonight, I really have needed this so much. Thank you so much for welcoming me, Dre and poet friends. I've been a little MIA the last month or two and uh, it's really great to be here with you tonight. Thank you so much. Always a delight to have you. You know, you're always welcome here. Everybody yeah. unmute and show your love for Marianne Teft at this time. Yeah. Beautiful mm. piece. Marianne. Oh, thank you so much for that. Beautiful. And what a way to get things into, you know, back into the open mic section here. Great transition from that feature. Um, again, shout out to Zach for um, what was a dope feature. And uh, also shout out to everybody who has um, performed thus far. This has been such a groovy night and it's been, um, it's been one awesome wave of energy. And we're going to keep on riding this wave. So ride with me. All right. So with that said, on deck, we got Freedom. But stepping up to the plate now, please give it up for Black Noise. Unmute and take it away when you are ready. Hey, everybody. Um, just been sitting back listening and uh, I'm full. 
I'm full. I have definitely been fed tonight, so we can't wait to hear everybody else's coming up. <clears throat> this poem is called Sour Honey. Five, six. Thick caramel pecan curves cascade down street, drizzled upon six inch stilettos, accentuating the power in a quick seductive stride had those come hither I, voice smooth as honey, used beauty to create buzz, honey was a bad bee, but didn't have the mentality to be queen, letting anyone suckle to take care of her hive, trading nectar for monetary value. But when she goes home, feels the drain of auctioning off of self-value, come stained sheets, don't hold children with potential. Oxygen aborts the mission, Murder erased in gentle cycle. Every day starts with plan B to excuse half-assed forthcomings. Cocaine fits, feet filled with track marks. Belt wasn't tight enough. Toaster and tub didn't do the trick. Burden so temporarily cuts the load in half, filling syringe with proper CC. Single tear trickles down face, melting away world's ending. Days come and go without sun. Nights haven't been graced by stars. Tear-drenched pillowcases hold the dawn of lonely ambition. Swaddles depression like a newborn child. Mine became Satan's wasted jungle gem. But honey seemed to have it all. Defied gravity with a confident sleigh in our hips. Sewn in Brazilian bundles nestled between Saturn's rings, honoring nothing but dialogue and deeds concerning dead heads. Green ruled everything, plain wizard to nighttime emerald city, too afraid to let skeletons scrape the fool's gold bricks on deserted catwalk, being stopped traffic bad on fleek and paid, didn't subside abdominal backflip, burning. Churning sharp pains every time a back page call rolled in, snorting bumps to alleviate symptoms, self-medicating turned graduating to hits, speedballing before every trick, never letting anyone get close enough to love, never took good counsel, so she crumbled under self-inflicted circumstances, honey turned sour, no more sweet nothings to whisper, Frostbit had no more come hither in those eyes. Strung out, dehydrated bones caught self-loading down street. Monkey on back caused her to move on down to a viaduct penthouse in the mud. Your change won't change her. She's already spent. Can't afford a clue. Has no sense to live nor die. A bag a day will keep the demons away. But we thought, honey, had it all. Peace. Everybody on mute, give it up for Black Noise at this time. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. Woo! Woohoo! Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And we're just going to keep this ball of energy going. Oh man, this is this is awesome. Again, thank you all for joining us tonight here at Open Minds Open Mic. Um, and we're gonna keep this um, awesome night rolling. That said, on deck we got Terry Rose Jerson. But stepping up to the plate now, please give it up for freedom. Unmute and take it away when you are ready. Can you hear me okay? Uh, like it's not my foot or anything. Uh, checking my phone. Uh, um, um, I'd like to read like five poems or like mid length, if that's okay. Cool. Okay. Um, this one title is kind of like. Give me one second. Um, Setting on my phone. Um, 
Right. So I'm just to this, like, messages like this from who knows how many beings. <clears throat> you are the past, present, and future combined. And when they intertwine, my darling, the world will explode, waves crashing and old systems burning in the name of freedom. So please breathe easy, my dear. These struggles seem to be very deep. But there's no shame in what you no longer try to erase. And the strength of standing in that truth, there's glory in this, and we hold you in it. With pride and admiration, the lessons we're all learning will heal wounds too deep to even penetrate. And you will feel it also. Know your worth, and not that this is something of a fault or to be silenced in guilt, because you're the one that wants to hold all of this, and I don't think you understand how fucking admirable that is. There's no shame to be held, so give it away, and let us hold that and some of the pain. You are never alone, but I want you to know you can do it, and when you reach your hands out every time, we are together, years of lines and hearts, and the gobeat is bright beam. Do not shrink the pain, do not erase the shame, stand tall in it all. Every part of you is this, the pack of respect, and I can't wait for you to see all of it. I, Lee, love you endlessly. Uh, this next one is... I feel so ready the next one was more like a prompt of like mm, rainbow kaleidoscope winter girls for a rainbow in an attempt to hide the overwhelming darkness that was eating me alive if only someone could have seen the hidden messages and the intricate style of my braids but then my winter girl self was too frozen to let that seep through the words that needed to or I guess it's easier to look away to those that are frozen, to looking for my hidden kaleidoscope. But maybe not meant to be seeing the world through a rainbow and sunshine on the daily. Sounds like a toxic kind of positivity There's, that suffocates all the brewing, all the things brewing within me. The storm just needs to be released. And over time, the weathering cleaned up, comfort first this time maybe, gets e easier. Nobody really wants to think about the stupid dark shit that is heavier than it needs to be. In the sense of it's easy to take off all the responsibility to listen news instead of a bright emergency exit. Like, to claim this life as just mine, leave some of the heaviness behind. The perpetrators can hold that. I'm good with keeping too much in my backpack. Life's got enough rocks on its own. And the only healing I want to take ownership is mine. Enough scapegoat shit. It's such a dishonor to my soul, no longer allowing them to sidestep their own healing via methods of abuse that I'd rather forget. But for the love of my being, I'll work on that healing. But for me, not for a perfect version of human, not because I owe anyone anything, not because I need to be good enough, just healed enough to be worthy, to have a right to live and breathe freely. Isn't it ironic how much weight a victim of surviving carries? When that breath that's still labored, shallow, quick with fear that safety has not settled into yet, if one can even find it, however long that takes, those breath, this beating heart, is enough all on its own. For those latent with guilt over an existence, lifts of symptoms that comes from actions they did not choose, the confusion can be constant, but coming to terms with one's existence, being aware of generational curses, determined to break them, just that awareness matching the heart that keeps drumming regardless of existential feels is enough. So breathe easy. This rainbow after the storm as the clouds clear away is for you too. Thawing with the glittering atmosphere as the sun starts to peek out. Winter girls find their kaleidoscope key, narrowly escaping death with the help of settling spirits, finding spring again. And then three more. Second one. This is not a simple contention. It's a whole fucking revolution. It's a reminder that the strangers whose eyes you pass over have a story and needs from this community. You and I and me's. We are nothing without one another. If you think otherwise, you need to get it together. Yeah, love yourself, but isn't it easier to love someone else? Why is that? 
start there and find that love is contagious. It'll spread little buds within all of us. To love the self is to be able to spread it outside of ourselves. To those that are low, how hard would it be to lend a little flower? How much would you really lose? If you realize this truth, then you know it's only a gain to give. It doesn't take away. It builds up a flame and keeps us all warm. Like the sun chose eight planets, right? But those planets took moons and used their gravity to keep it together. Like Jupiter and all its greatness could have just been alone, big and strong. But I bet it felt like it wasn't warm enough. So it used gravity, keeping gal galleon Lily moons within it all and the other 80 something 70 something moons along with it because yeah see no matter how strong big and strong you are even the planets need other beings and i'm aware this isn't scientifically sound but the sun's warmth was starting was a starting place not to mention asteroids dwarf planets comets and all the other astronomical creatures none of us survive alone and if all of you've had until now is yourself then, my friend, I feel you. My hyper-independence carried me this far, but I always craved a love to settle into. Like when something good happens or I'm upset about something, having someone to talk to meant the world to me. Now I've found those peeps. All I want to do is carry everyone through this loving journey. Take my hand and come along with me. It's only a quarter or half or full self, whatever you can give, even if it's the little, smallest bit. The love we receive and allow ourselves to receive love we give and allow ourselves to receive can make all the difference. I have two more. It's been a while since I've read, so thanks to you. <sighs> Metaphors of the seas and trying to come up to shore. What happens when I don't feel like swimming anymore? So forget drowning. Let's imagine something else. What if I just burned up all the water, walked my phoenix self to the shore, broke down a little more, burned out. How long would it take before I reached beyond myself? How long till I realize I need help? In the timeline of accepting that, dried up with seaweed drowning wings, so flight isn't an option. My muscles feeling weightless, so I'm barely crawling. Maybe what's worse than the abuse itself is the self-denial. Like I know I didn't root that in me. I didn't care to it, water anything. I didn't care to it or water anything, but at some point it became part of me. I know it's possible to unroot those now. I don't have some concrete formula, despite wanting to bottle it up. It just seemed to happen in many moments. Circumstances that happen by coincidence, halfway in control of it, but alas, I'm going to dismantle the house and uproot the shitty foundation, burn it down and build my own little place. Home for me this time. Sometimes home becomes the people that respond in the moments because I need them, and I got sick of pretending a long time ago phone call, text messages, memes, whatever capacity. Thank you for being here for me. I finally feel less lonely. Transmuting some good love this time. Everything's complicated all the time. But in the little moments, I see the changes. I feel it. And all I can think as I sit in my house by the seaside is I'm so glad I'm still alive. Finally, this life of slash is my last one. Um, I just want to quickly interrupt. I just want to just put a limit there. Um, oh, we do we, we, we do have a list, and I want to make sure that this steadies along. Um, but with that said, I do appreciate what you were able to share here tonight. With that said, everybody, please unmute and give it up for freedom at this time. Woo! Truly beautiful. Very deep. Amazing to hear. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And with that said, I want to extend this invite to um, check us out in this Zoom room tomorrow for the Slam Jam at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be having Tanish Kaur um, as our mm -hmm. special guest coach. There'll Woo, be a Slam geez. <laughs> there'll be a slam there'll be a slam workshop where we pretty much simulate a um, poetry slam experience but instead of um getting scored you're getting feedback from the community and from the special guest coach and um every week it's a different coach different perspective and um at, aside from that there will be an open mic so um there'll be um plenty of room for participation and um we're looking forward to be hearing more from you um it's been a while since I've seen you um, in this in the Zoom. I feel like I've seen you in the past, but it's been an ill minute. 
Mm. But um, great to have you here. So with that said, we're going to keep the shindig rolling. On deck, we got Nadia. But step into the plate now. Please give it up for Terry Rose Jertson. Let me <laughs> take it away when you are ready. What's up, people? It's friggin' cold. It's even cold in my house. Look at me. I'm wearing a friggin' fur coat and hat and gloves inside my house. Okay, that's how damn cold it is around here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So with that said, I am about to use my muse, which is my mom. But also, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I have an angry poem first, <laughs> which I have to get out of the way. My anger has been on code blue since my prez was robbed of her seat on at the table. My anger is the inhuman-like drone at the ticket booth who refused to give my husband credit that he paid. My anger is the response on the other end of the phone that said, it is not our policy to do it that way. My anger is a world put on red, women and children left for dead. My anger is a Karen arguing politics over a Trump godhead printed on a worthless candy bar. My anger is a three gun shot fire and miss. My anger is the marketing genius that thought of this. My anger is a corner in a small-minded town spewed with endless red propaganda shit. My anger is the or orange tang neo-Nazi president in KKK America. Um, that's um, that. Here's second piece. Hope left the building with Elvis. Hope we don't blow up the country. Hope was still on the ticket until a few days ago. Hope was alive before cancer took away another artist friend of mine on the 8th. Hope we don't all die today. Hope was the babes in my arms as they looked up helplessly yet knew I was there to protect them. Nothing has changed. We still need to protect them from Orange Julius. Okay, moving on. Getting older is not so bad when you consider the alternative. This gem spewed out of the mouth of the woman who bore me and trained me up in the way I should go. She is now to the age where she said she was looking forward to her senility. This is worrisome for me and for her, making no contact and forgetting where she left her phone or leaving it turned off. Police wellness checks and her not understanding why. Second muse piece. Another unacknowledged birthday from the woman who gave me life. It's been many more days of the latter than the former. Seems incomprehensible to me that a mother can forget the passing of something roughly the weight and size of a watermelon out of her body. Not to mention the nine months of occupying the same body. So what? That time has passed. It wasn't as if she was the old woman in the shoe. She only had to. Life does get complicated as we age and have the body and mind failing on a daily basis, walking into that room and forgetting what you went in for, the panic that sets in when you misplace a bank card or another important piece of identification. Still, just an acknowledgement that I'm alive would be nice. I send her things to help her remember special days, but to no avail. Still, it is beyond the pale to be so oblivious to others that you forget your own child's birthday. And that's me. Everybody, please give it up. Unmute. Show your love for Terry Rose Jertson at this time. Right on. Hey, woo! Yeah. Wow. Wow, indeed. Wow, indeed. It's been such a delightful experience to be able to hold space thus far. And as of now, we have four more poets, the final four. And we're not talking about March Madness. We're far from March, first of all. So with that said, let's get on to it. On deck, we got Escape Artist. Let's step into the plate now. Please give it up for Nadia. Unmute and take it away when you are ready. Thank you, Dre. 
Um, I have two pieces tonight. The first one is uh, lead term in the soil. Birth is the discovery of beginnings, the place where the flow of life exists. Life is like a seed splitting apart, a divine transformation as a great journey begins. Life's river flows forward, carving its path, a body of water on fertile ground, creating conditions where diverse life can be found. A coconut seed falls to the ground, embraced by the earth, carried by waves, whispering of new beginnings. The land receives it with love and energetic hug, allowing space where roots are free to grow. Roots established, reaching for sunlight, aiming for love and freedom, stretching outward, leaning on inner strength. It learns, adapts, adolescence in motion. The divine plan whispers, growth is possible. Stability is near. Flowers bloom, bearing fruit, sustaining life itself in the process. Providing coconuts to beings nearby, the tree becomes a part of the divine balance, a web of life, delicate yet strong, integrating energies for all's well-being. The divine plan whispers, um, growth is possible. Stability is near. I'm sorry. I just got lost on my poem. Uh, hold on. Where, where did I leave off? Uh, providing coconuts to beings nearby, the tree becomes a part of the divine balance, a web of life, delicate and strong, integrating energies for all's well-being. Okay, here. Sorry, you guys. Um, in its prime, the tree thrives a surplus of life force flowing outward, every fruit, every branch, an offering of strength and nourishment. Coconut trees are water and earth, shelter and sanctuary for all beings, a safe space, a symbol of selflessness, resilience woven into every fiber. Unconditional giving, rare and true, each tree fulfills its essential purpose, contributing to the present, planting seeds for the future. But with time comes reflection. As decades pass, abundance wanes. The tree shifts to preserving itself, honoring the wisdom of natural aging. Every phase unveils treasures, from growth to giving, from giving to preserving, mindfully at peace. It surrenders to the divine plan, living fully in each moment. When its cycle ends, growth ceases. Decomposition enriches the soil, leaving nutrients for the next generation. Its legacy lives on, seeds planted, a final surrender to freedom, trusting in the eternal flow. Home. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I have one more piece that I would like to okay. share. Uh, kind of fitting given the stumble on my own words and brain fog. Um, this piece is called Perfect Imperfections. <laughs> we live in a world that worships the surface, that sets standards carved in stone, expectations of beauty that cut deep, like blades meant to sever us from ourselves. They see flaws as targets, Imperfections is something to erase, but they miss the truth. Beauty never fit in their box anyway. The harshest critic stares back in the mirror. It spits venom, daggers and spears, born from whispers that come long before, voices soaked in fear, fear of being too different, of never fitting in. And so we believe the lies, letting their poison seep in until it devours us whole. We chase perfection like salvation, dissecting ourselves into pieces, marking what's broken, what doesn't measure up. Where's the love in that? Where's the compassion for the mirror's reflection? Where's the space for grace? Where's the love we all deserve? Pain grows in the silence. In the self-hate, we plant like seeds, nurtured by comparison, 
watered by cruelty, our own and others, and it consumes slowly at first until it erupts like a volcano, blinding us with the heat of its destruction. And though through it all, we forget how to be kind to ourselves, to the fragile hearts we carry, but pain doesn't last forever, it can't. It begins to fade when clarity takes its place, when we see the truth of who we are, not the reflection they broke, but the light that shines behind it. It sounds impossible, I know, like magic or a lie, too good to believe. And yes, it's hard, self-love is never easy. It's a battle fought day by day, a journey where the road crumbles beneath you, and still, you take the next step. Every moment matters, even the ones where you feel your body give away, to illness, to trauma, to the slow wear of time. You are still here, you still shine. Even when the glow feels faint, it's there. Even when you don't see it, others do. And maybe, one day, you'll believe it too. Your perfect imperfections, the scars, the cracks, the flaws you once hid, they're part of your beauty. The kind that can't be erased, they are you. And they are finally enough. Poem. Wow. Beautiful pieces. Everybody please give it up for Nadia at this time. Wow. A talent that is blossoming with every performance. Keep it going, Nadia. Looking forward to be hearing more from you as uh, we continue to share space here every Friday here in the Zoom room. With that said, I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, Erica Floyd. Welcome to Open Minds Open Mic. Um, if you would like to be on the open mic list, give me a heads up. There's plenty of space and the list never closes. Open mic, you know, they're here. I um, should I say Open Minds Open List. So with that said, we're going to get going with this on deck. We got Debbie Segal. Let's step into the plate now. Get up for Escape Artist. Unmute and take it away when you are ready. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. Here's very deeply. Um, I'm going to do... Um, can you hear me? All right, cool. And then this one's untitled. It's like an old poem. For what it is, for what it seems, for what it claims to be, carve the truth out of the alphabet, regardless of the horror it harbors, for the blood spilled, for the bodies gone, that our pen sing their song. A pen has names written on it no one knows. The genocide in the Congo, the cultural cleansing of big, big, of big business, it writes in blood, in ink no one can see. Even if devastation brings it to a screen, people are blind with the fear of not knowing. And rather graze on the pasture at the slaughterhouse, instead of answering the forever ringing call of revolution. Write it down, all of it. Write history as it is, be it shameful or brutal. Whatever you do, write the truth. Thank you. Everybody on mute, give it up for Escape Artist at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. Amazing as always. We appreciate any and all contributions our community are willing to share in this Zoom room. And again, always a pleasure to have you, Escape Artist. Um, wow. I haven't really Thank fully you digested. For the space. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. Of course. I haven't fully uh, digested all the awesomeness that has happened thus far in this evening. And so, again, thank you all for uh, sharing space and for participating and just vibing with us here on Open Minds, Open Mic. It's been quite a pleasure. And, um, 
as of now, I think. I mean, let me just double check the list. I haven't had any confirmations of any additions. So with that said, we currently have two more poets. Um, but that could change. On deck is myself. And stepping up to the plate now, please give it up for Debbie Segal. I'm mute. Take it away when you are ready. Hi, everyone. Okay, I've just got one. Thank you so much for just letting people drop in whenever and making, you know, making a slot available for, for us. Belief is no substitute for inner experience. Carl G. Young glances in the mirror, glimpsing repressed convictions, stalking flourishes of idiosyncrasy, synthesis, and wholeness dispatched by deities, monsters, and heroes. Can science examine and measure individual personality? Not likely. Can candid stories told around a campfire diagnose mortal existence? Perhaps. The cardinal query persists. Is it mine? No metric exists to judge. Nothing to compare with or contrast against. No system prevails to profile a conviction nor form a rubric to answer the question, what is a self? Are we as individual selves a process over which we as individual selves have little to no inherent orchestration? Maybe. The individual self has no beginning. Earnestly, we know we don't know how it ends. Telling tales of the serpent, open maw, devouring its own tail around a campfire must suffice presently. Fleeting, moot, inadequate. A miracle, grow, wither, extinguish. Amid the flux, a kernel endures. In visions, dreams, and revelations dwells a wellspring of myth evermore abiding. A self is not a creation. A self is a happening. Thank you. Everybody unmute and show your love for Debbie Segal at this time. Right on. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Great and to I see love, you. I love reading your books. Oh, thank it's you. So I appreciate fun. you. I, I, I appreciate really you, it. Deb. Sister Deb. I'm here with I'm here with my son Thomas. What the heck? Oh no, this is my grandson here. Oh. Thomas is actually here tonight, so he'll pop in in a minute. He's oh, I thought you meant you were sitting there with him around a table. I am. Well, he, he just walked in the house. My grandson's right here, but I'll, he'll show up in a minute. You'll see. Our Thomas is out there with you? Yes, he came. I, I bought him a plane ticket, and he actually flew to see me. He's, he's here for nine days. Oh, wonderful. So he's already, we've already gone to the beach and had a wonderful time. Oh. It was just so beautiful. I'm so, so happy for I'm, you. I'm enjoying the visit <laughs> after eight years. Right on. That's wonderful news, Deb. And thank you very much, Debbie Segal. And shout out to Thomas, chilling with the family over in, uh, was it Fort Lauderdale? Yeah. Hell yeah. Good times. Good weather, from what I'm hearing for the time being. And um, that said, currently, um, as of now, we just got one more poet um, for tonight, unless um, someone wants to pop in or say something um, who hasn't gone already. But with that said, um, without further ado, give it up for me, your host. Top dog. All right. <clears throat> I had an adventurous day today, and I just felt like having a little fun tonight. 
sometimes I like to mix it up with some serious, some political, or sad shit, and with some funny. But we're going to have some silly shit. So, um, so, it's, so basically, sex, drugs, and um, offbeat impressions. First piece. <clears throat> so, I asked myself, how would Macho Man Randy Savage write a um, an erotica poem? So, here's um, Savage Kink. <clears throat> Adulthood is a lonely neighborhood, yeah. I walk down that lonely road and the world is treating me coldly. Dead body cold. Yeah, there have been times in my prime in which I had a better chance of pushing a camel through the eye of a sewing needle than finding warmth in this emotional ice age. But it all takes is a little spark that illuminates through the dark, finding its way to grow into an ember with a company warmth that will surrender into a wildfire that doesn't destroy but rather builds into a ball of intensity. Rivals of forces of a thousand suns, yeah. I'm gonna render you into a state of shock, yeah. And you will not become a dad for a long time, yeah. I'll make you sigh and wheeze and sweat and bleed, and you'll feel like you've been in a car wreck, but I won't make you bleed. The heart of the conflict is the glorious to triumph. There is nothing wrong with little shrubbery and patches. Yeah, nothing wrong at all. Nothing wrong with grabbing a little bit of bush and tugging it by the roots and see how you react. And when the nerve endings from that area shoot to the spine and a divine leak in your mind, yeah, you will find something you've never found before, and that's a new kink, yeah. That's a new kink. And that's getting a little savage like that, dig it. And before you know it, you will succumb to my might and you will be looking up at the lights, consumed by the madness. Yeah, the madness will consume you faster than a blink of an eye. It will happen so fast you won't be able to talk about it. Life comes at you fast, but oh, you will be coming faster, yeah. So don't blink an eye, don't buy any ripe bananas. Because you might not live long enough to consume them. By the time that the dust is settled, you'll be reduced to a puddle of pleasure in which I will bask and bathe in. Oh, yeah. Dig it. Poem. I'm sorry for that, everybody. Or you're welcome. I don't know. But, as I said, sex, drugs, and offbeat impersonations. Well, here's the drugs part. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked myself, well, what would be a fun new product that Billy Mays would promote? Then this came together. This is called Smoky Puffs. <clears throat> Has your breakfast become quite a bore? Good news, because fret no more. Hi, Billy Mays here with Smoky Puffs. America, it's time to wake and bake with Smoky Puffs, the hot new cereal with everyone's favorite wildfire, wildfire prevention mascot, Smokey the Bear. Yes, kids, Smoky Puffs. Kid tested, DEA approved. Kids nationwide will be raving and caving into their cravings for Smoky Puffs. 100% organic, 100% safe to consume, 100% legal, and only 420 calories per bowl to keep you cruising through the bruising of everyday life. Obtain higher education like never before because you be baked like a cake but getting better quizzes getting better scores on your quizzes and tests forevermore. And kids, remind your parents that they too can enjoy Smoky Puffs. It's a perfect midday treat to help you power through yet another work week. It can be part of your next hiking trail mix for your cannabis fix. Only you can prevent forest fires and Smoky Puffs will help. So put the bowl down and grab yourself a bowl of Smoky Puffs today. Um. Thank you. Ba, ba, da, ba, da, ba. <sighs> yeah. Wow. You are not what you seem to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> You're not... a scary man. Oh, my God. 
<laughs> Lord, have mercy. Uh, rain. Yeah, I, I love that one. That one's good. <laughs> Woo! Oh, wow. That was fun. Thank you all for uh, allowing me to get a little silly with y'all for a moment in this trying time. And um, again, thank you all for sharing space. It's been an incredible evening here at Open Minds, Open Mic. Huge shout outs to everybody in the room and huge shout outs to Zachary Cluckman for what was an incredible feature. Heartfelt throughout um, from, from start to finish. Um, I, I think we all needed that and you delivered and then some. So thank you. And um, just to give everybody a reminder, check out what he's got going on on Instagram. Um, check out the festivals and events that he's uh, running and um, get in on that. From what I hear, Albuquerque is a pretty cool spot. And this man will uh, show you what, it's, what it is all about down there. Um, Plus again, great food. We got great food all over the place. That's the other advantage. <laughs> Well, I mean, we don't have any smoky soft. puffs, but we got green chili, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, Southwest cuisine, like check into, like get into that, and <laughs> yeah, if you find some, some smoky puffs, let me know because that'd be some wild shit. You never know what you could find in a dispensary these days, seriously. But um, with that said, enough talk of that. Um, thank you again for sharing space, all y'all. Um, a reminder, again, we'll be here in the Zoom room tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for yet another open mic and also um, the, um, the Slam Workshop. All together, we're going to have the Slam Jam. And again, we'll be having Tanish Kaur as our special guest coach. So um, you got any pieces to uh, workshop or you just want to just have fun in the open mic or just vibe, this would be the spot to be at tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope to see you all there. Until next time, everybody, please keep loving. Please keep writing. Peace and love to y'all. And have a wonderful rest of your evening. <laughs>